advice from the second row here was start and they will come. So I'll follow your advice, sir. Okay, our speaker has agreed to answer questions as usual, and uh, we have two roving microphones, so please raise your hand. We'll also try and repeat the questions just to be sure that you hear the questions. And if you don't, remind us if we forget. Okay, I'd like to know a little more about the gangs that are <laughs> apparently dictating terms in those countries where people are so eager to leave. And are they, do they just make their living being extortionists or are they uh, uh, cooperating with the governments or what passes for governments in those countries or are they uh, selling contraband or what, el what else is going <laughs> on among them that makes it so difficult for everybody to escape or stay? Right. That's a great question. So the question basically is what is the story with the gangs and how have they developed such a tight control over certain areas of, of these countries? Uh, again, El Salvador and Honduras in particular, I think are the two countries where that's a, a, a um, significant phenomenon. Um, Guatemala, certainly there are reports of that, but it's not as widespread um, as far as I understand as, as El Salvador. And Honduras, um, what is it? So uh, I think extortion uh, is a main source of revenue um, for these gangs, and uh, they're well-armed, um, well-connected. Uh, you asked if the um, if they w work for the government, I think in many neighborhoods, and it's a it's a very neighborhood specific uh, phenomenon. And uh, I think it's better. The better question is how much of the government works for them. Um, so I, I think a lot of the police, the local police, uh, are again. I don't pretend to know have hard evidence of this, but the reports I see and, and hear um, are that uh, many of the police officers are on the payroll of the gangs and they essentially set up shop in these neighborhoods and they're, um, I mean, it, it goes back. So in the early 2000s, uh, the, the government of Salvador at the time tried an approach called the Mano Dura, which roughly translates into the Iron Fist approach to the gang problem. And so they, put, they rounded up as many young men with tattoos as they could find and put them in two prisons, one prison for MS-13 and one prison for 18th Street. <laughs> and those prisons quickly became gang central for the operations of the gangs. And uh, so it backfired, <laughs> essentially. Um, and then, you know, uh, there are people who know a lot more about the nitty gritty details of how the, the economics of the gangs, um, but my understanding is that this extortion is basically once you've established terms with your area of control and the officials that are uh, assigned to look out for it, the hard part's done and the money just comes through. Um, yeah, uh, uh, yeah. So that's all I can say is that they have reached a point where I mean I've started to go back into the U.S. history and kind of try to figure out what happened in the 20s and 30s with uh, the mafia in in many of our major cities because I think there's a similar story that can be told. Maybe yeah. Maybe some of the answers about how to get out of this. But you know, you think about Salvador, Guatemala, and uh, Honduras. So these are three countries whose democracies are 20 years old, essentially 25 years old. Um, and they have 200 years of uh, dictatorships behind them. Uh, so the rule of law, that, that idea is still beginning to kind of consolidate itself. Um, and you know, you think of our country 20 years into our democracy, we were still 30 years away from a bloody civil war. 
Uh, so it's, you know, starting a democratic system of government in these conditions is incredibly difficult, um, even in the best of circumstances. Uh, so that's not a great answer other than to say um, it, they have pretty tight control. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you. I, I really appreciate a lot of really great takeaways here. Mm -hmm. I'm puzzling over Guatemala. Uh, I think it's the most interesting thing in your data, mm -hmm. why it doesn't fit the pattern mm -hmm. you're saying. So I'd, I'd like you to speculate a little bit. Sure. And, uh, to tip my hand a bit is uh, El Salvador, 72% urban. Guatemala, only 50% mm -hmm. urban. The rural area, extremely diverse uh, with uh, very diverse indigenous populations. Yep. Um, up there, no real economic opportunity for mm -hmm. the young kids. Uh, climate change impacts along with insecure Absolutely. land tenure, yep. enormously problematic. Mm -hmm. uh, down in Guate, uh, mm -hmm. clearly maybe a little bit more like uh, El Salvador and, and Honduras. Mm -hmm. yep. Would that get at some of the discontinuity? Yeah, great question. and. Great answer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you said everything I was going to say. <laughs> no, um, I, I think you've hit on the big ones. So the uh, the rural urban dynamic is clearly at play in Guatemala. The the notion of thinking climate change, you know, right as you said it, because this whole region, the Seca corridor uh, that runs through Honduras and uh, is affecting part of Guatemala as well. I mean, that's where we're starting to see kind of a return of some of these uh, economic and food insecurity um, uh, elements to the migration dynamic uh, that we did not see, frankly, in, in 2014. Um, and that's really in Honduras. So, you know, Honduras is faced with this double challenge. But I think another aspect of Guatemala that you kind of that you didn't touch on is that, and again, this is my understanding, I don't pretend to be an expert in narco trafficking, but my sense is that the, um, the trafficking, drug trafficking operations that use uh, the northern region of, of Guatemala to land planes, um, because it's so rural, uh, they, in a sense, have a stronger hold on control of gang activity than what's happened in Salvador and Honduras, where you know the traffickers kind of avoid those countries and just use Guatemala. And so that dynamic has resulted in less of a grip by these gangs that are in your face every day. There's still crime, there's still high homo homicide rates, these sorts of things. Um, and as you said, in Guatemala City, there's certainly uh, significant extortion, um, you know, bus, bus driving is one of the m most dangerous occupations in Guatemala City because of the massive extortion um, system going on with public transportation there. But I think, um, again, you hit on a lot of what's driving uh, migration, at least from our numbers in Guatemala, seems to be a bit more on the economic and food insecurity. So we were calling it kind of insecurity uh, or scarcity um, more than what we see in, in the two other countries. Yeah. Yeah. Or are you next? Or I would be next? interested in your judgment. Is there something about the British political heritage that the Americans and the Canadians had versus the Iberian, Spanish, and Portuguese political heritage south of the Rio Grande that has caused this really stark difference in political success uh, in their countries? That's a really good question. Um, so certainly that case has been made with the British Caribbean, uh, former colonies, I guess marginally, well, in some cases, much better governed. Um, you know, for me, it's hard to disentangle that from where the U.S. has been involved uh, for economic and political reasons. So, you know, you don't see a history of U.S. involvement in Belize. 
Um, but right next door, you see extensive involvement of the U.S. through the United Fruit Company, you know, back into the 1800s with just constant meddling in the political and economic affairs of these Central American countries. Why, why that's the case, um, you know, it, it's the fate of geography in some respects. Um, but back to your question, I think uh, certainly there's a good amount of literature to suggest that uh, the British political legacies were a bit more favorable for success than, um, than the Spanish and, and Portuguese. I mean, if you look at some of the British colonies and former British colonies in Africa, you might come up with a different answer, though, <laughs> because they, uh, their track record there is not quite as good. Um, so, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to go to Venezuela. <clears throat> uh, I've been there several times since 2005. First went there in, in 1991. Uh, but here in the last few years, I have gone uh, to Colombia instead of Venezuela mm -hmm. uh, because of conditions there. Sure. And you mentioned the refugee situation. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, when I was there, I most recently, <clears throat> I go to uh, the lowland area where, the, uh, where it's cow country, cowboy okay. country. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're right on the border on the Rio Arauca, uh, which is famous in the folklore of the region. And the very first thing I saw when my friend picked me up at the airport was street performers mm. from Venezuela who were crossing and they were using the street mm -hmm. performance. You know, jugglers, dancers, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. unicycle people. You know, I mean, it was very interesting. And yeah. when, in fact, because I'm interested in the music of the area, uh, we went out of our way to recruit those kinds of people for mm -hmm. private <laughs> events. Anyway, you mentioned Venezuelan refugees being such a big issue mm -hmm. in <laughs> South America. Mm -hmm. How about in the U.S.? Here, you know, it, it's like you, you used the Nicaraguan example, right. that the Nicaraguans didn't, mm -hmm. <laughs> didn't experience the same problem. Well, how about the Venezuelan refugees? I know of a few in the United States, yeah. but I had not heard that there was quite that many in South America. Great question. Uh, so I haven't seen much data on Venezuelan asylum claims in the U.S. Um, I do know that they uh, by far have uh, filed the most asylum claims across uh, South America. Um, my sense is there is a bit of a, a Venezuelan population in, in parts of the U.S. And when you have family um, members in the U.S., there are other ways um, aside from a filing an asylum claim to, to gain legal status. So there's family re reunification and various other visas that you can get. Um, so I, my sense, and again, I'm treading on somewhat shaky ground here, my sense is that uh, the Venezuelans that have come to the U.S. have pursued um, somewhat different um, avenues for getting legal status, albeit perhaps temporary. Um, but getting that legal status uh, allows you to work, you know, gives you work authorization. It gives you a lot of things that even if it's temporary, it's, it's much better than being under, underground. Um, and yeah, I, you know, I, um, yeah, that's about all I can say about that. I, I really don't know much um, more than uh, what I've seen and kind of reports and things of that nature. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm always kind of discouraged about the split between academics and government. <laughs> <laughs> um, how does research like yours get to the government decision makers so that it could ha really have a positive effect? Yeah. And uh, second question, I'm going to sneak in okay. <laughs> about Nicaragua. Um, you you attribute the the lack of migration now to to the asylum decisions that were made back in the 80s. Is there any 
anything else today that explains the lack of migration from Nicaragua? Is it that Sandinista revolution might have succeeded, <laughs> e even though I don't agree with Daniel Ortega, Ortega and what yeah. he's doing now? So right. two questions. Okay, I'll take that first one, or the last one first. Um, so there is significant migration in Nicaragua. Um, I think it, last I saw it was like 55% of Nicaraguan migrants are going to Costa Rica. And they're primarily economic. Um, that has changed in the last uh, few years as this political situation has grown worse and Ortega has clamped down um, on opposition. And it is quite, I mean, people, um, I think, you know, are seeking ways to get out, perhaps, of, of among those target groups. Um, but the numbers aren't nearly um, what we're seeing in the, the other countries. Um, the extent to which uh, the Sandinista legacy can be seen in, in modern day Nicaragua, I think, is in um, the community neighborhood based policing. Uh, uh, strategy that the Sandinistas adopted. I had a grad student who did his dissertation on this um, in terms of how that was really, because Nicaragua has one of the lowest homicide rates uh, in the region, even though they are one of the poorest countries in the region, right? So, you know, by all accounts, the, it, things should be worse there, uh, but they're not. And his, his argument was that it was really, you could see kind of concrete evidence of these lasting effects of this really neighborhood kind of cop on the street, get to know the community approach that the Sandinistas employed back then, and it never really changed once uh, Tomorrow and, and the others took over. Uh, in terms of getting uh, word out to our, our work to government officials, um, so I'm a... <laughs> So we released a report in 2014 entitled Violence and, Cent and Migration in Central America. I told this story at dinner. And it was, that, it was designed to reach policymakers, about two or three pages, very, you know, just the facts. And about six months later, I got a call from the ACLU saying, uh, Dr. Hiskey, do you know that your report on violence and migration is being used by um, the Department of Homeland Security uh, it's quoted in an affidavit <laughs> by one of the uh, CBP agents uh, in a lawsuit that we filed against them. And they were quoting our work to justify the blanket detention policy that Obama had put into place in 2014, um, basically inferring from our findings that if we let them go, everybody else is going to follow. Uh, and so the lawyer asked me to write a counter affidavit, which I was happy to do. And happy to say, actually, one of the proudest moments of my life <laughs> was the judge's final ruling was in favor of plaintiff. Um, they ordered the Obama administration to cease and desist in terms of their blanket detention. And the judge had about a half a page quote from my affidavit <laughs> saying, <laughs> saying that the CBP is full of it, and they don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> so, so, the moral of the story is it, it feels good when they take it the right way or when it works in the right the direction you want it to. But, you know, research is research, and, and we try to strive for objectivity and letting the numbers uh, say what they say. And they can be used uh, in ways that you don't expect or, or don't desire. So it's a... <laughs> but I think, I you know, in general, I think... A more informed discussion is a better discussion, uh, wherever the facts may lead us. Yeah. Or. Oh, yeah. We're, we're going order. Where are we? Oh. Are we? Here? <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Um, there you are. <laughs> when you were talking about asylum policies in other countries, um, you know, you mentioned, um, let's see, I had written this down. Well, anyway. Australia well, and, yeah, and, and the European did, countries. And, yeah. yeah, and you never expounded why Australia's asylum policy was so bad. Can you? Um, um, yeah, so it's, so they have, um, so if you have a tourist visa from an uh, uh, undesired country, uh, they stop you before you enter the um, uh, Australian soil and search your, uh, your phone, your, your social media. Uh, they, 
they search you up and down to tr try to figure out if you're gonna stay over your visa. Uh, they pick people up at sea, they do asylum claims in uh, these uh, kind of uh, outside of the country. Um, essentially, you know, they have versions of uh, Guantanamo where they store people <laughs> until their asylum claims are processed. And I've read accounts, I, I don't, again, don't pretend to be an expert on Australian asylum policy, but um, my understanding is that they are, have faced the same kind of things that we face, which is just detention without end, never knowing when, when your case is gonna be heard. And again, I think it's driven by an attempt to deter people. Um, and, and what does, I mean, it's funny when you start looking for that deterrence uh, strategy, it pops up in all of these statements and all of these policies. And what is never kind of come to terms with is people, when they have a gun to their head, they could care less about your deterrence policy. And even if they know, so I have one, one article uh, entitled, Leaving the Devil You Know. And it's, you know, that's, what, that's what's going on. It's like, I, I got something right here. I may have heard that I'm gonna be in detention for two years, that I'm gonna be separated from my kids, that this or that, or this is gonna happen. I don't care. I gotta do something. I mean, it's, it's uh, taking control of your life. And, um, you know, when they get to that next part of their life, then they'll deal with that. But um, that's what's kind of frustrating is it's just like uh, the, around the world, that seems to have been uh, the strategy that, that many governments are falling on and without, I mean, you know, it's easier said than done to deal with the push factors, to deal with what's causing individuals to, to be, put themselves in that situation. But um, I don't think the deterrence uh, is really working that well. Um, okay. Hi, uh, look into the future of U.S. policy. You know, you talked about and showed the example of Honduras which after 2012, when the US, Hillary Clinton helped overthrow the government of Honduras, <laughs> things went to yeah. the wrong way very quickly. <laughs> and the same thing in Lib Libya. I think these are probably two of the worst countries in the world because of what we have been doing in, from the US perspective. And one of the candidates for president, Tulsi Gabbard, she says that uh, we need to stop these regi regime change wars. And I wondered what you think of that idea because it seems like even in Iraq, you know, we, oh, this guy's a bad guy. We got to, you know, throw out the government and, and uh, wh where does that lead us? And do we really want to keep doing these regime change wars? <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> I would say, so sticking in my region of the world, which is Latin America, um, I would say that our regime change efforts, um, depending on, the, on what you would classify as the des desired outcome, um, and I think that's where it gets tricky because um, regime change in the name of democracy and stable government, well, in the name of democracy, um, has not worked too well. Uh, you, we can have a litany of, of examples from all over Latin America um, where we've intervened. And, uh, you know, I might come, come up a bit short on, uh, like, out and out, we changed their regime. We may have contributed to, to things happening there. But, um, but if, uh, you know, if you want... Um, so it's a question of what U.S. policymakers want out of a, a country, um, I think, is the best way to evaluate <laughs> whether they've succeeded. But if what you want or if what you know, citizens want is a peaceful democracy, then certainly U.S. intervention has, does not have a good track record. Uh, there's one report um, that looks at all U.S. military interventions from uh, post-World War II, I believe there was 55, and 
um, only three of them could be considered successes <laughs> in terms of uh, arriving at a democracy. Um, that, so Panama um, would be one of them. Um, you know, Panama is a reasonably stable democracy post-89 uh, invasion. Uh, there's a couple others. So I'm not sure if that answers your question, but uh, uh, yeah, in general, I, I you know, um, I would say we're we're not uh, we're not bringing about positive change when we do that sort of thing. Question I have is, if you look at <laughs> if you look at you know the situation and you've analyzed facts for many years on this, it'd be interesting in a utopia what you would think the solution would be. My question is either you're looking at bad people in the country that are running the country that are chasing people off as one solution or the world accepting refugees forever. And it like, like now it seems like we're seeing more and more refugees in the world just trying to mm -hmm. get away. Mm -hmm. And so you're taking cultures and completely moving them based on fear, not that they really want to go there. Mm -hmm. It's just fear, which I think is a little different than some of the immigration we had in years past. Mm -hmm. So back to what do you think is the solution <laughs> and whether or not we try to solve the problems in those countries. Well, we know U.S. getting involved with it doesn't ever go right. But uh, so do we well, put up with immig uh, immigration yeah. for the rest of uh, yeah. time? Yeah. Yeah, a few things. So, I mean, I think there, there are a lot, of, a lot more nuances in terms of the types of responses a government can have to the situation rather than kind of doing all of this or all of that. Um, I will say, looking at the Mexico example that I, I mentioned and the states that were the highest migrant sending states in Mexico, I mean, that's, I think, uh, a potential um, piece of evidence that US involvement done the right way, a free trade agreement that is beneficial on both sides for a variety of parties, and yes, it's gonna have losers as well, um, can make a dent in this migration culture that we had seen in Mexico develop over, over decades. With the refugee situation, I mean, you're absolutely right. It, you know, it is a very incredibly complex and difficult situation to come up with a solution that's gonna happen overnight. Um, I think, you know, sanctioning people, not sanctioning governments, not on uh, whether or not they accept, accept third country status, which is what just recently happened, but rather sanctioning them on performance metrics for things like corruption, regaining control of neighborhoods. I, you know, there are, it's, you know, it's, it's not regime change, it's not military intervention, it's using our carrots and sticks in ways that can maybe have a longer term sustainable uh, impact on, on this situation that we're dealing with. Um, and like I said before, it's not a sexy answer, uh, and it's, it will take time, but the alternative is doing things that essentially are sticking our head in the sand for the root causes, um, and so we're gonna be constantly kind of confronting this problem again. So, yeah, that's the best I can do for you. <laughs> if I come up with a, the, uh, a better solution, I'll, I'll be sure to let you guys know. <laughs> so, so talking about different set of carrots and sticks. Yeah. Uh, substance abuse, drug trade. We keep uh, hearing that. You haven't talked about it tonight. How much of an impact would we have to change? Would we have to cut our drug use in half by 30%? <laughs> or what level would it start to make changes uh, down south? And yeah. or, or is that just silliness? And no. It's, it's really not going to yeah. make much difference. No, that's certainly the... What, my Mexican friends tell me all the time is uh, if you guys would quit selling us guns and quit buying our drugs, then we, we would not have near the problems that we have. Um, and I think the gun, the gun issue is a big one, 
Like that, that's, uh, I'm not, again, I don't know a solution per se in terms of how you stop that, but uh, I know it's a problem. Um, on the drug consumption, I'm not sure that would make too much of a dent on the problem in El Salvador and, and Honduras because the drug trafficking operations tend to, as I said before, bypass those two countries. It certainly would make a big impact on, on uh, Mexico, the country I know best. Um, the, the problem is, so when we've, uh, the, we have uh, cut into the uh, marijuana revenue streams of the cartels in Mexico quite significantly over the past 10, 15 years with legalization efforts. Um, and what those cartels have done is branched out into extortion. Uh, so now they are extorting avocado growers in the state I did research in, Michoacan. Um, I, I had some a field agent, uh, agricultural agent, basically break down telling me about what, uh, how much control the cartels have over the avocado growers. So when you have your guacamole, uh, <laughs> it makes it hard to enjoy it. Uh, but there's a price, an extortion price list. And again, it's, it's gotten to the point where everybody knows what the price is. So it's kind of easier to do business. Um, and killings have gone down. But, uh, but that, you know, there are these unintended consequences of, of anything. And I think one, I was a big proponent of, yeah, let's cut into the cartel revenue in Mexico by legalizing in the US. Well, we did that, and now they're extorting farmers and teachers. The teacher union in Guerrero was saying that the, the entire workforce of teachers in Guerrero is extorted every paycheck they get. Uh, they're asked for a payment. Um, I, I don't, yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah. Yes. The, uh, you've touched on it a little bit, but there's a guy by the name of Gene Sharp who wrote uh, From Dictatorships to Democracies, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, these are a whole bunch of uh, dictatorships, whether it's cartels or it's you know, corrupt governments or whatever, okay? Now, I also think that these cartels, uh, if you're living in a world where cartels are running the show, there's so much fear going on within the cartels as well. But we're not, in a sense, uh, I mean, I think education, in a sense, is the solution. And, you know, small-minded thinking creates big problems, so we have to reverse the whole situation. So putting it in a, you know, uh, an analogy, dropping uh, <coughs> books, not bombs, right, mm -hmm. would... Um, destabilize these so-called dictatorships, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And not only that, within the, even the dictatorships themselves, they get tired, everyone gets tired of fear. Stalin was tired of fear himself, I'm sure, if he could have ever acknowledged that, so mm -hmm. to speak. But, but um, uh, this Gene Sharp uh, has covered the range of, I, I think before, so-called uh, before the first century, of all kinds of solutions that have been effective. These are real working solutions. Locked Walenza out in Poland and just all kinds of, you know, our civil mm -hmm. rights movement. Mm -hmm. And you see small-minded pe small people that are not aware of all kinds of solutions, mm -hmm. right? How many slaves does it take on the plantation to change the mind of the, the master of the plantation so he doesn't abuse the slaves as much? It just takes one. And if we wanted to do anything is to get the kind of information in, just literally trash the area, you know, take helicopters in or whatever and just bomb them with uh, Gene Sharp's books and other, <laughs> and other solutions. I mean, we think that's silly, but, but you know, we have no problem throwing a bomb in someone, but we have a problem giving them a book or giving them some insight or just Give them something besides Western civilization. Just confuse them with so many facts about what uh, other possible ways of living are that they think beyond the narrowness of violence. Yeah. 
No, you raised some good points. I mean, and I will tell you that there are a lot of very qualified, um, very uh, empathetic people on all sides of this question that are working their butts off to do exactly what you're suggesting. And people on the ground, uh, people I know in USAID, um, uh, various other development organizations, uh, people, N NGOs in El Salvador and Honduras, I mean, people are thinking about it and trying to do as much as they can. Um, and I, yeah, I don't know if they've read this book or not, but uh, I know they've read a lot of books and thought about this probably a lot more than you and I have and recognize the complexities involved and they, yeah, and, and we, we have evidence that, uh, as you suggest, kind of, you know, starting with basic building blocks and, and starting uh, getting people, learning how to get people to trust their police and have police be trustworthy is one of the keys. Like, reforging that relationship between citizen and state, I think, is a, a first step. And, you know, you're going up against a multi-billion dollar industry and you got cops that are getting maybe $10,000 a year. Um, so it's, a, it's an incredibly difficult challenge. Can I say one more thing? Mm -hmm. I don't know what you call it. I call it persuasion pyramid. If I can convince you and nine other people of something, mm -hmm. okay, like let's quit killing, okay. I didn't do my job unless I convinced you to send that to 10 more people, okay. We're not voting here at all. This is delivered to democracy without the vote, mm -hmm. okay? And guess what? How many, how many uh, levels before you have 100 million? Mm -hmm. Eight levels. You just need the one slave that's sensible enough to read the book while he's hiding under his bed, mm -hmm. so to speak, yep. and come up with just little ways of driving wedges of understanding even into the minds of all these dictators. The world's filled with dictators. This is no different. I don't care if it's South American dictators or it's Adolf Hitler or it's my father who was a dictator of his own household. Same solution, right, virtually. Yeah. Are there any questions <clears throat> here? Yes. I'll try to make this sort of short. You've touched on some of it. One thing I didn't want to make a comment on is I have been to Guatemala on a mission trip and a lot of the people there, the ground, ground roots people, they're wonderful people and they are trying and they, mm -hmm. they grow food in every inch on a mountaintop mm -hmm. because they're in such dire straits. They stake out their cow if they happen to have one on a road and then a while later one of their children goes and moves it because they have nowhere for them to graze. Mm -hmm. So they're really struggling just in subsistence Everybody has their own little garden, mm -hmm. and they don't have much, but they make a little bread tortilla type thing and maybe some tomatoes, and they have a chicken that makes eggs. So you got to really, and I know you do, you got to really understand they're struggling day by day just to survive. But yet in that survival on this trip I went on, they were the most welcoming people. Um, they gave us, they would give us the, the shirt off their back if they needed to. And they're trying to form like groups and stuff with, I would call them co-ops almost, with farmers. They really are trying, but they're really up against it because they've got the gangs and stuff. And we were told we couldn't go to the bathroom at night because we were staying in people's homes. And they locked the doors and we just had to kind of hold it because <laughs> God help us if we had to go out to the outhouse, we'd be kidnapped, killed or whatever. And that's in their own backyard. This is what they're dealing with. Um, and so I just want to maybe say that because the integrity of the rank and file people there is just enormous and they are struggling. They are trying to fight back in any ways they can. But now my real question here is, I'm just curious if, if the, the people in these affected countries in Central America keep coming north, are any of them trying to go south, like say to Costa Rica and Panama? Mm -hmm. They are two fairly stable countries. Mm -hmm. Could you maybe address what's going on in Costa Rica and Panama that maybe could influence other governments so they could get better, and how are they dealing with possible immigration? Yeah, so uh, just a quick remark on your 
first comments is I absolutely agree. And it never ceases to amaze me how amazing um, individuals are in the face of what seems to a stranger to be a really difficult situation. Gracious, um, uh, just, yeah. So I would agree with your sentiments. Um, in terms of what's going on in Costa Rica and uh, Panama, there is, we are starting to see some movement down there. Um, getting through Nicaragua is a, a bit difficult, but um, uh, you know, I think what generally the attraction um, in terms of the U.S. has been, again, goes back to the 1980s and having somebody that you know or uh, having a family member is um, certainly going to reduce the, the costs of, of making the trip up there. Um, Costa Rica uh, has clamped down quite a bit on migration, um, in, in large part because of the Nicaraguan influx of economic migrants. So they're, they're, they're not too receptive. But I, I think a short answer is that uh, that's probably the next step down the road in terms of trying to bring these countries into what uh, solutions we arrive at. Um, so yeah, I think both Panama and Costa Rica. So Costa Rica, you know, has not had a military since 1948. Panama um, uh, has a fairly f vibrant economy. Um, so yeah, they, they are potential landing spots uh, moving forward. We have time for one more question. Well, I was going to ask about south southern migration, but there's no point in that now. So let me ask you about opportunities for people coming north but not succeeding into the U.S. and job opportunities mm -hmm. or resettlement opportunities in Mexico. Yeah. Does their economy allow them to support some of that? Yeah, that's a great question. That's actually um, what we're starting to see. I, I, I was in Jalisco in probably three years ago. And even at that point, there were significant Central American populations starting to set up in cities like Guadalajara um, and Mexico City. Um, Mexico's economy is uh, an interesting one in that it has some very, very vibrant success stories. Certain states that are uh, really successful, largely based on foreign um, foreign investment and assembly plant type operations. Um, so if there, if there are labor opportunities, it's going to be in those states. Um, and, you know, whenever we can find a solution for um, getting a handle on the violence that's taking place in, in Mexico, which is somewhat different than what's going on in Salvador and Honduras, you know, I think there's plenty of opportunities. Um, Mexico is seems to be trending upward despite a rising homicide rate and um, short-term difficulties in some areas. Um, I, I think it's on the right track. And so if that is the case, and if you look at the fertility rates, then Mexico is going to be in need of, of labor for, you know, a kind of uh, those secondary jobs. So. Um, that may be where a lot of Central Americans end up. Um, I mean, my sense of what the impact of all of these uh, policies that have been put, put into place in the last two or three years is you are going to see people going farther underground to get, not literally, but to get across the U.S. border. So whereas they were self-surrendering and trying to follow the law, as you hear critics often say, they were following the law by seeking out a Border Patrol agent and filing for asylum. Uh, they're no longer going to do that. And so we're going to, you know, we'll see wh how traffickers figure out to get through whatever's put in front of them. Um, what we do know that as border security has increased, the price of coyotes has increased and the number of deaths at the border have increased. So two known quantities of increased border security is people go 
through more dangerous places and traffickers charge more money. And it's a straight trend line <laughs> of amount U.S. spent on border security and number of deaths occurring at the border and the, the cost of a coyote to get you across. Um, and where there's money involved, and you know, we didn't even talk about the port of entry issue, which is that's, that's another avenue to cross the border illegally by bribing U.S. Uh, port of entry officers. Uh, so <laughs> again, um, I think we're not addressing the, the roots of the problem, and uh, you know, these kind of crossings are going to continue one way or the other. Yes, yeah, exactly. So this, this phenomenon known as circular migration, um, which is again an economic phenomenon, um, not, I don't think you'd see that with uh, uh, refugees. Um, but, um, but yeah, before border security, Mexicans did not stay as long <laughs> in our country. What we did was lock them in place uh, in the 80s and 90s. Um, so anyway, I'll need to wind that. things up. Could we possibly conclude that our government is guilty and we are guilty of looking very for very simple solutions to an extremely complex <laughs> set of problems? I will be guilty. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's right. No, yeah. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you all for coming. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.